Welcome to another edition of Careers That Matter. Today I'm joined by Kathy Peters. Um, Kathy, I don't quite know how to describe exactly what your job is um, because you're an advocate for marginalized, vulnerable, uh, in particular girls, but also boys. Um, what would you say your role is right at the moment? Well, I, it's simple. I'm an educator. I'm an educator and I'm into prevention education. So that's what I am. I've always been a teacher. I've been a teacher since I was three years old. I've always wanted to be a teacher. And so I just teach, I just educate. That's sort of my calling. And I've always had a heart for the vulnerable, uh, um, a very um, deep heart for the vulnerable. And the funny thing is our three children do as well. So it's lovely to see how that's been passed on in our family. And this has been the area, and certainly in terms of child sex trafficking, has been the area that nobody's talking about, and it was a logical area to step into. Hmm. So right now, how much of your day on a day-by-day -day basis is consumed with sharing information about how to stop sex trafficking uh, in Canada? Well, my husband would give you a different answer. <laughs> my so husband, he would say 24 hours a day. <laughs> he yes. would say yeah. nonstop. I mean, I certainly uh, am up early in the morning and I'm going late at night and I just keep uh, sending emails and messages and hard copy letters and phone calls. I phone everybody I know. I'm in touch with media. Uh, I'm just out there pretty nonstop. It's really been a 10 years of work, um, very full time. Huh. So. Give me an example of, let's say yesterday, what did your day look like? What, what were the different elements that you went through? Oh, well, yesterday was unusual because that was Human Trafficking Awareness Day, February 22nd. So I had a lot of invitations to present and I couldn't do all of them. I focused on one. So we have a brand new human trafficking uh, initiative or round table that's just developed thanks to the Lieutenant Governor General Janet Austin's very interested so that was about two three hours yesterday of just making connections with corporations um, organizations like Covenant House um, uh, police agencies uh, YVR they've stepped up the Port Authority uh, the hotel industry, they're all interested in addressing this issue. So anytime I go to an event like this, it's all about networking and meeting more people. And I do a lot of preparation work before I go. Mm -hmm. So I bring materials, um, I connect with people beforehand, and then afterwards I, I, I give feedback. I love to give feedback, ideas, suggestions, strategies of where we could go next. So yesterday, that, that was a full day from first thing in the morning till probably 10 o'clock at night. And today you're doing interviews. Today I'm doing the interviews and the same kind of thing, and I'll I'll rave to everybody about that you were willing to interview me. And you must read uh, volumes uh, to make sure that you're staying on top of uh, what the challenges and issues are. How much reading do you do? It's pretty constant, and my husband complains I only read about one subject area. <laughs> um, but I really want to keep up with what is going on currently. So, for example, I gave you a whole bunch of CBC articles and current articles from the newspaper just to say, yeah, this is really, human trafficking really is what is going on right now. It's a big problem in Canada and certainly in British Columbia. So I do a lot of reading. We travel uh, quite a bit, and when I sit on pool decks, I read. <laughs> I mean, I have to know my stats. I have to know my research. That's why my book is out. At the end of every chapter are all the stats, the research, uh, footnotes, endnotes. And at the back of the book is all the research. I don't want anybody to accuse me. You know, you're making this stuff up. I am not making this up, folks. Right. So you mentioned your book, which leads to my next question. How much of your time do you spend writing? Because when I looked at your book, I went... Okay, this is in depth and is very, very uh, meticulously detailed so that you can demonstrate uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that what you're saying is backed up with evidence. That book represents 45 years of learning and listening. So I have this funny habit of writing everything down. When people tell me a story, and you're a storyteller, this is what you're good at. I write down everybody's stories. So my book is a compilation of all the stories because people would say to me, I don't want to talk about my story publicly, but would you tell my story? So I'd put a different name on it or I, I'd pull together a whole bunch of stories, but give the public an idea of what this thing looks like. But literally I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people, but it is 45 years of learning and listening. And now that I've really gone full time with this for the last 10 years, 
now I'm really getting the stories and the emails. My goodness, the emails. Uh, and they're heartbreaking. So I, if I sound a little bit passionate, I am. Okay, let's go back over the course of your career. Um, you enter post-secondary education to become what? You said that you always wanted to be a teacher. Is that what you went to school to do? <laughs> so, I mean, not very original, not very original at all. I went to UBC and, and got a teaching certificate. I got a degree in home economics, so I taught home ec. Life, but it's life skills. I don't even know if they teach it anymore in high schools, but I taught life skills, and I taught in a high school, junior high school, near the King George Highway. And I loved it. It was hard. It was very hard. Our students were vulnerable. A lot of them were involved in, in sex trafficking, involved in gangs. Those are my students. So I had probably the most popular class in the school. Not that I was a good teacher, but I fed everybody. So I was teaching basically cooking. <laughs> and that really worked. And it gave a lot of people hope to the point that a lot of these young people in my area would not even finish grade 10. So I'd have students that would finish grade 10 and go on to become chefs. Their lives were changed. Then they'd come back and visit me and would say, you know, when you were my teacher, you inspired me to make something of my life. So that's what really was what started this whole thing off. So you said that you were the most popular class, and you, you, you said you fed them. Are you talking metaphorically there, that you were feeding them with the ideas that could empower them to do something different with their lives, or you were actually giving them food, or no. maybe a combination of the two? <laughs> no, good. That's very good. You know, it was a combination of the two for sure. I mean, they, they were eating the brownies and the chocolate chip cookies. I mean, that was a total hit, and I had a lineup of students outside the door wanting all this food. But it, it, certainly it was more than that. It was giving them hope. I think giving them hope that they could do something with their lives. And I had some very, very disturbed, very disturbed young people that I taught. And they got the first B or A in their lives. And it gave them hope. And they would say things to me like, you know, I couldn't pass math, I couldn't pass science, but I got my first A ever. And you've given me hope that, you know, I, I'm valuable, I can actually do something. So if that doesn't make you feel good, well, isn't that amazing to be able to give somebody that feeling because it is so fundamentally important. Um, I, I think it was Adler who pointed out that, you know, the love of parent or a mentoring uh, adult uh, is fundamental to one's self, a sense of self. Uh, and you were able to provide that. Well, I'm thrilled you brought that up because you see it's pimps and traffickers that have gotten really good at coercing and saying that they are that and they yeah. will provide the love. That's why I say to parents, say to your children every day, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, because if you don't, the pimp will. Mm -hmm. So along the way, you're teaching home economics, but your, uh, your role is shifting. How long did you do that at that school? I wasn't even there that long. I had one year in the interior, which I loved, and I did teach indigenous students as well. And then I had four years sort of in the inner city high school. And then um, I got married and had a family and then put a lot of effort into raising a family. So at what point did you then uh, step back into this? Is it 10 years ago? So you, you devoted a good portion of your career in life to raising a family. Absolutely, exactly. So what happened uh, 10 years ago that made you go, okay, I have another contribution I want to make? Well, basically what did it was our son. Uh, he was working in Ottawa for Joy Smith. She's the member of parliament that introduced our laws on human trafficking. We, we really need to thank her. So I did a lot of volunteer work in her office. And I'm just a mother bear. I'm a mom. And she had me take care of a girl that had been sex trafficked. So I got to take care of her for three days. It's not a safe thing to tell your story. And she wanted to tell her story. So I got assigned to her. So instead of getting, you know, hiring a police officer to take care of her and protect her, they assigned me. And I heard her story. And I just couldn't believe it. She was being interviewed on CBC, just telling her story, how she got sex trafficked at age 11 years of age. Wow. I mean, a child. Um, she was Caucasian. She was white. She came from a family of six children. She was the oldest straight A student, played the flute, a track star. Her dad started to drink alcohol. The family fell apart. All six children got put into foster care. And her foster father sexually abused her. And that mm. is not uncommon. <laughs> not uncommon at all. Smart girl, though, right? Straight A student. And she ran, hit the streets in Toronto within two hours. And it's less time now. Within two hours, 
she was picked up by an older gentleman who said, come on home with me. I've got girls, a house full of girls just like you. That night she was, um, she was on alcohol and cocaine for the next 10 years wow. and servicing men 24 seven, seven days a week for 10 years solid. So I'm hearing her story in CBC uh, studio. I'm in the back bawling my eyes out thinking, this does not happen in Canada. How could this happen in Canada? So when we're driving back with Joy Smith in the front seat in the taxi, and I'm sitting behind, beside this gal, I'm bawling my eyes out, and, and she goes, it's okay, it's okay, Kathy, what's wrong with you? And I said, this has to stop. This stops in Canada. I cannot stop it in this country. I will stop it in British Columbia. That was my promise to her. So that's where this has all started. I promised this gal I was going to stop it. What do you think? made you open to this to pursue it because I'm moved by the story that you're telling uh, but it touched you in a way that said I'm gonna actually do something about this and so what is it about you that you feel uh, gave you the energy to pursue this? I'm a mom I'm just a mom I'm a mother bear when I present to the Indigenous uh, women and girls, and I do a lot, I say I'm a mother bear, they eat it up, they love it, they totally get it, you're a mother bear, we get it, we get it, we get it. You don't hurt children. You do not hurt children. It's really simple. Uh, my children many years ago said to mom, said to me, would you ever kill anybody, mom? And I said, if somebody hurt you, I'd probably kill them. Yes, <laughs> I could kill somebody. So it's children. We don't harm children. So that's the sort of raison d'etre, that's the passion, that's my heart. You do not hurt the marginalized, the vulnerable, mm. you don't hurt the little ones. So somebody who's watching this goes, wow, I love the passion that you have for what is now your mission. Um, I want to be you. <sighs> what would you suggest to them that they do a little self-examination and say, double check that you have this quality? What would that quality be? Oh, simply care about humanity and be willing to give hope. And I, I do, if I can just tell one short story, I have one young fellow that reached out to me many, many years ago. He now presents with me. And we've presented to Global Summit. So he was in grade 11. What I didn't realize is he had, he had cerebral palsy uh, in a wheelchair his whole life and only has one finger that works. And he's been presenting with me for the last six years. But he contacted me and said, you know, uh, a friend from my youth group was murdered because they were trafficked. Wow. And this is from Nanaimo. And he said to me, I have to help you stop this. So I took a whole year. Um, we met on Facebook and I went over the issue and basically trained him. And then I gave him an assignment. I said, now I want you to present to your city council in Nanaimo. He did, he got a standing ovation. They said it was one of the best presentations ever. And he since pre presented nonstop. He's at university now, Vancouver Island University. And he's doing his honors degree in philosophy. This is a boy that everybody had written off, that had grown up in foster care. Again, one finger that works and and he's just taking off. So there's my hero. I know there's lots of heroes out there. So it's what I said, you know, learn about the issue, share and alert, and you'll find me along the way. You want to come alongside, please join me. So one of the other elements uh, that I think about as you're talking is that there could be a whole host of people who are looking at it going, oh, but what what difference do you make when you're just one person? And, and I am motivated by the idea that um, what you do matters, and it matters in ways that you can't actually know. Uh, because by virtue of the fact that you start to do something, you're influencing change. And who knows how that will play itself out. Do you have that feeling um, that, yeah, this, this is making a difference, even though I can't necessarily tell you exactly how it's making a difference? Well, absolutely. I, I just know when I present in high schools, a lot of high school students come up to me and hug me. I had one boy with a hoodie and he was big and he held my hand and he wouldn't let go. Hmm. And he said, don't stop. And he was bawling his eyes out and he just held my hand and said, don't stop. I've had indigenous women come up and hug me and hold me and not want to let go. And they say to me, every time you open your mouth, you're saving a life. Yeah. Pretty nice uh, recognition of the work that you do, isn't it? To know that you make that kind of difference. You know, there's this concept now that I'm uh, 
quite um, taken by of social purpose, mm -hmm. moving beyond DEI or ESG, but social purpose. And social purpose really is making the world better by what you do. And you are making the world better by what you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathy.